But today, Jerry Rawlings is unemployed. He was sacked from the forces by the civilian government to which he handed over power. He now lives in a small flat with his wife, a designer, and spends his time driving round on his motorbike, trying to keep alive the ideals of his June the 4th revolution. What sort of a society are we trying to create here in Ghana? <laughs> Shall we call it a balanced society in every respect? You know, where everybody's potential will be acknowledged. I mean, where we'll have, a, let's put it this way, a dignified society, you know, where justice will be seen to. And uh, generally speaking, a more equitable distribution of the country's wealth, you see. The recognition of the creative talent within us that's been lying dormant, consciously or unconsciously, or unconsciously being suppressed. You know? And now, a year later, after the handover to civilian rule, how does the country measure up those original ideals? As far as the prices of food items are concerned, it's shot up again, you know. It's even worse than it was before we came in. But what I'm more concerned about is what appears to be an attempt to restore the pre-June 4th order. And uh, it's going to create a lot of problems. It's almost like an attempt to re-cage the people, you know, to stop them from trying to assert themselves as a result of the awareness that, that has come about as a result of June 4th. The main aim of Jerry Rawlings and the AFRC was to stamp out Kalabule, an all too common Ghanaian word for profiteering, racketeering and corruption. Market women were accused of hoarding food in order to force up black market prices. Kalibule was checked for a time, but not for long. The new civilian government has only been in power for nine months, but inflation is around 100% and food is being sold at well over recommended prices. At this market in Accra, the market women were asking four CDs, about 75p or the lowest minimum day's wage, for a few tomatoes or a bunch of bananas. A small bag of rice was going for 600 CDs, compared to the recommended price of 120. A tin of milk was going for five CDs instead of 0.75, and sardines for eight instead of 1.6 and this in a country where the average wage is 200 CDs, just over 30 pounds a month. The result, inevitably, has been a demand for wage increases and strikes. Workers from GHOP, Ghana's biggest state holding company, are striking over the government not approving their 15% pay rise and the fact that only managers are being given an extra cost of living allowance. They are angry, but by British standards, not exactly militant. They lobbied Parliament, and there was trouble when hungry workers grabbed for the MPs' breakfasts. The government reaction was to sack all 8,000 GHOC workers and tell them to reapply. So they blamed their poverty on the government. How tough has life been for the, your workers, then? Oh, terrible. Because, honestly speaking, some of them, some of them even take water has every fats. They just have water for breakfast. That's right. What is your reaction then to the civilian government? You were promised that there would be no more corruption, that they would continue the good work of the AFRC. Yeah. Do you, yeah. I mean, do you agree that the AFRC were doing good work? Yeah, we agree with yeah, the AFRC. We, we, so we, what is your reaction now to what's going on? No, our yeah. reaction is simply disappointment. We are only disappointed, that's all. A world away from the calm yeah, diplomacy of the castle, the president's predecessor goes visiting. Rawlings has refused to leave the country for an easy life on training courses, safely out of the way, like other members of his AFRC. He has stayed on, a man without a party, but determined to keep alive the ideals of June the 4th. When he visits a village outside Accra, he tries to enthuse the people to help themselves. What about the cement uh, for the pig story we're trying to do? It was only today that uh, they said we should come, but... Uh, during your, your time, uh, uh, 
it was approved. But later on, after you left, you left the scene. I mean, things have gone back again. Rawling says he offered his services to the new government as troubleshooter on agricultural problems, his current concern. He's frustrated and angry that they declined to make use of the enormous influence he still has in the country. They were frightened of you that you might build up uh, some sort of power base from your this, work in the agricultural yes, sector? Yes, I know. This, this is what they kept on uh, complaining about, of course, behind my back, you know. And, uh, of course, these are little indications as to, you know, their choice of priorities or what they see. They're, they're paranoid. It's an expression of their paranoia about me. But even if I'm supposed to be enjoying this kind of uh, respect or fame with the people, let's at least put it to some use, you understand? I'm not asking to be an agricultural minister or anything like this. You can keep me in the forces, but, I mean, detach me to mobilize the people all over the place. I mean, they say a, a hungry man is an angry man. The least you and I can do is to do something about their stomachs, you know? And you don't seem to see the priority. Now it's catching up with them. But is it just straight mismanagement, then, you're saying, from the government side? I don't think it's just a question of mismanagement. Even if it is, there are a whole lot of other factors too. I mean, human factors, the lack of appreciation of the dominant group or the people who are supposedly holding those offices, you know, not appreciating, you know, the problems of the common man, the worker, the ordinary man, you see. And as a matter of fact, this is where I spend a lot of time trying to infuse, you know, the new mood into Le Mans. And, uh, Somehow or the other, it doesn't seem to have paid off. Instead, I'm the one who gets stabbed in the back all the time. Rawling says he sees Ghana moving towards a new crisis. It's, it's becoming explosive as far as I can see. And one, it could be as a, because they're ignorant of the mood of the people. For a whole lot of reasons, because they may have enough in their stomachs. And I'm making the mistake of equating their feelings to that man's. But that's where they're wrong. Because that man is hungry. So, I think it's generally a question of at which level to pitch the compromise. In other words, it's a question of the haves against the have-nots. And the rate at which to tackle the country's socioeconomic problems. The have-nots, the hungry ones, like I'm saying, or as we all know, cannot go on working and having to drink water for lunch. They are the hungry ones. They are the ones who are being used. That's the productive uh, section of the society. The dominant group are satisfied somehow and are trying to sort of dictate the terms or how to regulate our rate of solving the problems. But you cannot do that because you don't, you're not standing in the fire and you're trying to sort of tell the man who's standing in the fire the rate at which to jump out of the fire no, he knows it, and he's anxious to leave it. Prices and the return of corruption are one area in which the civilian government has failed to live up to Rawlings' hopes and ideals. The treatment of those he found guilty of corruption could be the next. Rawlings sees houses like these from black marketeers. This one belonged to a man called Kojo Sardine, so-called because he was alleged to run a sardine price racket. He did so well that he was planning to build another mansion at the end of his garden. Now, thanks to Rawlings, he's in jail. Another seized house belonged to a European, who used to guard it with Doberman dogs and even a cheetah. According to the Rawlings plan, a house like this should now be used by the state and not just by an individual. But the committee that looks after confiscated assets has come under pressure to reverse this policy. Our committee has recommended that it should be given to the tourist development company. But the vice president is requesting that he be made to stay in. But we haven't submitted our report yet to them, and they have the final say on it. So the vice president wants to take this house over for himself? Yes. Now, under the agreement that was made with the AFRC, the transitional provisions, all the confiscated assets, such as this house, are supposed to be given to the state, aren't they? Yes. So what was your reaction when the Vice President wanted this house? He wants, he wants it to be allocated to the office of the, um, the castle, I mean the government, so that it will be used as the official residence of the Vice President. But it means that he'd live here, though? Yes.
The rising tension between supporters of Rawlings and the new government is highlighted by the fact that an armed, plain-clothed squad is now tailing one of Rawlings' associates. Captain Kojo Chikata is in the car travelling slowly on the left. The armed men are on the motorbike, and on the car turning as it sees us filming. A few minutes later, the men in that car stopped us at gunpoint. They tried to seize our film and arrested producer John Coker and roughed him up, asking why we were so interested in filming Rawlings. Officially, Jerry Rawlings is no public enemy. After all, he handed over power to the present government. But the government are frightened of him and seem to think he could be swinging to the left to emerge as a new focus of opposition. Are you sorry you handed power back to the civilians so fast? Let's put it this way, at the point of handing over, I don't think anybody could imagine that we'd have this kind of situation again, or that this dominant group would be so daring. You're very surprised, very shocked? Oh, yes, very. Like I'm saying, it's probably because they're ignorant and don't realize, you know, what the repercussions would be, how explosive it's going to be. With your disappointment at what's gone on since you handed over power, then would you like to come back to power again in any form, at any time? No. You wouldn't? Hmm. You know something? I'm more concerned about what I call the enlightenment exercise. In other words, exposing the other side of the coin to the people. There's no point in giving a hungry man a plate of food if he's not equipped to ensure that some smart man doesn't pull the plate of food off his face. Now this is what has been going on. In other words, I used to say, look, people are so hungry, the least you can do is feed them. But now I'm going further because analyzing the situation, it's not that the food couldn't possibly be there. The food could even be made available. But the man is not equipped enough to ensure that he eats that food. So even when it's provided, he's going to lose it. So what you have to do is to arm that man to ensure that he does not allow anybody to pull that plate of food away from him. The return of democracy to Ghana is not yet threatened, but it's already under pressure. After the earlier attack by Jihok workers, the parliament building was heavily guarded when they marched to the courts nearby to try to fight their sacking by the government. Their leave to appeal was dismissed. So far, there's no sign of the people turning against civilian rule that was so widely welcome after the years of military rule. But as poverty and inflation continue to plague Ghana, the strains are beginning to tell. And Rawlings is in the wings, waiting to see what happens.